Thank you for coming to tonight's program with David Fenton and Jane Fonda. I'm Andrea Grossman, and I'm so delighted to host this event tonight. Writer's Block has been around for 27 years, and we've always featured writers and issues dedicated to social justice and to social activism. David Fenton embodies those two pillars of change, and Jane Fonda has become the symbol, the moral voice of so many great movements within our social landscape. I'm so proud. David Fenton has been a guru to activists for 50 years, and his projects have included social justice crusaders, such as Abby Hoffman, Nelson Mandela, Yoko Ono, and so many more. We need him on the ground now, seemingly now more than ever. David Fenton's book, The Activist Media Handbook, will enthrall anyone who wants to take a stand and who wants to be a part of a social activist movement. The handbook tells stories of what works, what doesn't, and how to frame an issue. And it offers do's and don'ts throughout the book. The photographs, the personalities, the sample of ads that make you stop in your tracks, this book has it all. From the Vietnam War protest to climate change, it is my great hope that congressional and Senate campaigns will use this book as a guide. Well, the good candidates, anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to regale you with Jane Fonda's awards and accomplishments in film and television. That would take hours. Her work in social justice and activism has helped to define eras in American culture. Just consider how her fire drill Fridays have called attention to climate activism. She has ensured that all of us pay attention and that all of us know that the right kind of noise produces response. For decades, Jane Fonda has made her name synonymous with a call to action. So here's what's going to happen tonight. David and Jane will chat. You can ask questions when they're through. No speeches, questions. And um, I will have a microphone and we'll pass it around. So uh, David will call on you and I'll run around with a microphone and I'll get my steps in. Um, <laughs> So um, afterwards, David will sign copies of the Activist Media Handbook. I love this book, and I'm so proud to introduce David Fenton and Jane Fonda. everybody. Are we lucky to have her here or what? <laughs> We're lucky to have him here. Okay. Um, well, I'm very uh, pleased to be here and very honored that Jane agreed to do this. Uh, I first met Jane in 1978. Really? Yeah. <laughs> in Santa... At, at Inuk? As we were planning the No News concerts in 1979, that's right, I came to Santa Monica and met with Jane and Tom and got them involved. But I interviewed you for the first time when I was running a hippie underground newspaper in Ann Arbor in 1972 or 3 about the Vietnam War. I sent you that recently. And she was incredibly well informed about the Vietnam War. It was very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> So, at any rate, thank you, Jane, for doing this, and thanks. He also was for very here. helpful to me when I was in D.C. for four months with Fire Drill Fridays in 2019. I appreciate it. Payback. Yeah, you got arrested a lot. I did. Yeah. <laughs> you gonna do that again? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> I, are you gonna join her? Okay. That's what it'll take. Okay. So. Uh, so I wrote this book to try to uh, help the, the younger generation of activists that we're all going to need to help uh, with some of the things that I've learned about how to communicate to spark activism uh, and 
it's really an important thing to know because ultimately we're trying to convince the public to help us change things. So we have to communicate with them, right? And so I've, uh, if we go, oh, I have to click this thing. Okay. <laughs> So I, I've tried to cook this down to some basic rules, and we could go into some of this more later. But the most important rule is that messages have to be simple, and they have to be repeated. The, the brain only learns from the repetition of simple messages. And so public opinion only changes when people are exposed to repetition of simple, compelling messages that touch their hearts, not just their mind, that have moral stories, that have characters that are both good and bad, stories and messages are what change the brain. And I feel we could be better at this, and so I'm hoping that the book makes a contribution to us doing better. Now, I'll give you an example of this that's gonna make you all cringe. Make America great again. Okay, so we hate that. But, but we have to come to terms with the fact that that works. And we need to learn from that and do this. And my postulation is in the... the 60s, we were better at it than often activists are today. So if we go to the next slide, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's at an anti-war demonstration that Rennie Davis organized in Washington, D.C. in uh, 1970. And uh, I, uh, I had to carry a, a helmet and a gas mask everywhere I went because we were constantly being tear gassed and the cops were constantly attacking us. And so I got to uh, photograph all the great riots and demonstrations uh, of the era and uh, meet all the people running them. And I had dropped out of high school to be a photojournalist, so these people became my professors. And it was quite an education, actually. Uh, and so I got to photograph some interesting characters. <laughs> and uh, so that's Liberation News Service, where, which was my first job after dropping out of high school. And Liberation News Service was a collective of uh, journalists trying to expose the truth about the Vietnam War and American imperialism. And so they became my professors. And uh, I had a press pass so I could go to things like this and photograph them. And I got to take pictures of all kinds of interesting people. Uh, that's Muhammad Ali at a Black Panther demonstration in Harlem in 1969. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was very, very actively supporting the Panthers that people don't really know. And this photograph uh, was taken at uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, where the American, you may remember this, Jane, the, the, the American soldiers, active duty soldiers who refused to go to Vietnam were, were taken and put in the stockade, the military jail at Fort Dix. And so we had frequent demonstrations there, and, and some of them got very, very violent. And at the entrance to the Fort Dix, New Jersey stockade was that sign, <laughs> written by George Orwell. <laughs> so this photo circulated all over the world, and it eventually embarrassed the army into taking the sign down. So this was my first PR victory. <laughs> so this was taken in Central Park. Uh, that kid burned an American flag and uh, two mounted cops uh, caught him and beat the living crap out of him. This was my childhood. This is how I spent my teenage years. Um, and this, I don't know why the size of it has shrunk, but I hope you can see it. Uh, this was taken at Nixon's inauguration in 1972 in Washington. And imagine, back then, we actually had to hold up signs to say, judge women as people, not as wives. That was like a new thought. <laughs> <laughs> so I also got to photograph some of the, hey, in the control room, do you know why the photos have shrunk all of a sudden to such a small size? Is there anything that could be done about that? They were big at, to start with. Okay, so who knows who that is? 
Keith Richards in the, in the Rolling Stone. That's right. Okay, much better. A little distorted, but what can you do? And another small one. Okay, that's good. That's enough. So there's Mick flying through the air. So I got to see all the great music of the time. And of course, at that time, a lot of the music had anti-war and countercultural and peace and progressive messages in it, and which fueled the movement, which is not really the case today. So my most important professor of activist public relations was this character, Abby Hoffman. And I miss Abby really all the time. He was such a genius. And I asked people, have you ever heard of Abby Hoffman? Who here has heard of Abby Hoffman? Okay, well, that's pretty good. You know, on college campuses, like, nobody's heard of him. Until I say, did you watch The Trial of the Chicago 7 on Netflix? <laughs> and people say, oh, right. And I, Sasha Baron Cohen, that's Abby. <laughs> Abby was uh, the funniest person I ever met. Uh, and he was outrageous and outlandish. But he really understood how to get the television news media to report what he and his group of merry pranksters did. You know, he started this group called the Youth International Party, the Yippies, and it used to amaze me. The New York Times would run stories, today the Youth International Party said, and I'm like, what? This is Abby and three people. <laughs> so he was a master at this. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that a great documentary gets made about Abby, and one of my favorite scenes will be, he went on the Oprah Winfrey talk show of the time, the Merv Griffin show. Oh, yeah. And at the time, wearing an American flag as a piece of clothing, remember, was highly illegal. He, he would wear an American flag shirt and get arrested for it, so he went on the Merv Griffin show, and they blocked out half the screen. So you could only see Merv Griffin, you couldn't see Abby. And the producer of that show was Roger Ailes, <laughs> who later went on to brainwash a third of America with Fox News, right? So, yeah, Abby was amazing. And uh, he came up with the idea of running a pig for president of the United States. <laughs> Vote pig. And as, as you know, other pigs have run since. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so here you have me in another incarnation. This is the one that embarrasses my children. Um, so I'm doing PR there, right? I'm on two phones, and I'm trying to get this guy out of prison named John Sinclair, who was sentenced to 10 years for two joints in uh, Detroit. And it became a big cause celebra. And uh, we eventually created this huge concert to get him out with John Lennon and Yoko Ono and Stevie Wonder. And it was a very interesting thing because the Michigan Supreme Court had refused to let him out after two and a half years. And his case was a constitutional challenge to the marijuana laws. We did this concert. It was broadcast all over Michigan. The Beatles had just broken up. So this was like the biggest thing that had ever happened in Michigan. And the Michigan Supreme Court the next week let him out on bond, overturned his case, and agreed it was unconstitutional. And I said, wow, this rock and roll thing is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> so this is John and Yoko performing at that concert. And for trivia experts, that's Jerry Rubin on Congress. <laughs> so, so when Sinclair got out, we uh, went about uh, trying to legalize marijuana in our little college town, Ann Arbor. And we eventually did. We took control of the city government. We made pot a $5 parking ticket. And so to celebrate, we did a contest. And this was the grand prize, win a pound of Colombian. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, we, we weren't worried about the police because we had legalized the possession and sale of marijuana. So I delivered the pound to the winner. Have you ever seen a pound of marijuana? It's like a lot. <laughs> so, so, the winner, that's her. She was a, a freshman at the University of Michigan and never smoked in her life. And so we took this picture of her and proclaimed her the winner. And we did this two years in a row, which was pretty funny. And so then I went to New York and I got my first real job at High Times Magazine. I was an editor 
And it was a tough place to work because all the dealers would descend on us, so we would choose their marijuana buds for the centerfold. <laughs> so then I went back to political action, and I was working at Rolling Stone magazine, and I met Bonnie Raitt and John Hall and Jackson Brown and Carly Simon and James Taylor, and we did these concerts at Madison Square Garden, which is when I met you, to talk about helping. And we called it Muse, Musicians United for Safe Energy, and we did five nights at Madison Square Garden, a record and a movie, and we uh, branded nuclear power uh, pretty well at that time, which is a whole other story. There are climate people who wish we hadn't done that. I don't agree with them, but I understand where they're coming from. So to get on with this into the Q&A, this is, I started my firm in 1982. This is the first story the New York Times did about us to just do public relations for human rights and social justice and the environment. And I got to meet a lot of interesting characters in the course of that, including this guy. <laughs> and that's me uh, on the left in Fidel's office. Uh, Bill Zimmerman. That's right, with Bill Zimmerman, who had so much to do. Well, he was part of, uh, he ran Tom's Senate campaign. He passed the, a lot of great ballot initiatives here. And so Fidel, asked me about his image in the United States, which I told him was pretty hopeless, but <laughs> I, I said, you know, when you travel, this green army uniform doesn't mean to the rest of the world what it may mean in Cuba that you liberated them abroad. It means you're this horrible military dictator. I wouldn't wear it. <laughs> so, you know, the people around him were really nervous. Like, you don't talk back to the, you know, the jefe like that. And he, there was this long pause, and he said to me, next, you're going to tell me to dye my beard black. I said, no, the beard's okay, but the green army. He, he never wore them again on a foreign trip. So I come home, and the FBI calls me and tries to recruit me as a counterintelligence agent. It's really true. <laughs> so so the, the biggest honor of my working life was working with this guy, I, we represented the African National Congress for years. Before he got out, we organized his first U.S. tour. I helped him with the presidential campaign. The only saint I've ever met. Incredible human being. And just to run through some of this quickly, this is a, a campaign we did. Some older people here might remember about a chemical called Alar that was very dangerous in apples. And the whole country stopped buying the chemical because of the PR campaign, and they withdrew it from the market. This is an ad I did in the, before the Iraq invasion. Osama bin Laden wants you to help him recruit more terrorists by invading Iraq. Unfortunately, we didn't succeed. And, um, and I'll go back. this is Yoko Ono in 2012. And she started a group called Artists Against Fracking and uh, succeeded in uh, getting Governor Cuomo to ban fracking, one of only three states, New York, and this billboard upset him quite a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but it did work, and this is Yoko and Sean Lennon with the very, very poisoned uh, water from the fracking wells there. So, I want to end and uh, get to our uh, 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 talking with Jane, especially about climate change. I want to show you a. Uh, just two quick ads we've done on the subject. Um, so this, as you know, um, Fox News and the Wall Street Journal to this very day deny that humans are changing the climate, and yet investors, like, listen to the Wall Street Journal? Can you imagine? So we made this ad about Fox News. I think if I click it, it'll work. Residents have once again been asked to conserve water as the drought reaches its 16th consecutive month. Smoke from the Rockingham County wildfire was actually visible from a satellite 22 miles in space. Southern Californians flock to beaches in record numbers as temperatures soar for the fourth consecutive week. Florida residents are bracing for more coastal flooding as storm surges continue. I hope you all have a wonderful night. We, we tried to buy this on Fox News, and of course they wouldn't take it. So we ran it on CNN instead. Uh, one last thing. So as I said, you, you, the communications, the most important rule is repeat simple messages. So the American public 
uh, doesn't know that all the climate scientists agree that humans are heating the earth. Only 20% of the public knows that. Most people think there's enormous scientific disagreement when there's none. So we're trying to get the message across that actually they all agree. And we made this ad, which is the last thing I'll show you. If 97% of all dentists told you a tooth couldn't be saved, you'd pull that tooth. If 97% of all engineers told you your house was unstable, you'd move. And if 97% of all airline workers told you not to get on a plane, you wouldn't. So when 97% of the world's climate science experts tell you our planet is warming and we're responsible, why would you ignore them? When you're 97% certain, you're certain. Protect America from climate change. Especially if you are. Your mic. Do I need it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of really helpful stuff in here for those who want to know how best to change the system. <laughs> um, I want you to go into more into where you write about the communication rules for activists. Okay. Do you want to do that? Sure. Uh, let's see. I'll open them up. Uh, you know, the media has changed, and it's very fragmented. You know, uh, when we were protesting the war, there were three television networks, and if you got something on two of them, the whole country had seen it. Those days are gone, so it's a much more complicated environment now that makes following these basic rules even more important. So the first is to repeat only simple messages, Repeated, 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 change public opinion. That, that's the first one. So, the stories need good and bad characters. Now take climate. So, we have some really bad characters, don't we? Yeah, we sure do. Oh my God, it, maybe they're the worst characters ever. One was even Secretary of State. <laughs> it's true. You mean the Secretary of Exxon? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, the public doesn't really know this. It's actually the truth that these executives at the oil, coal, and gas industries and their paid political prostitutes um, are willing to end life on Earth to make money. And uh, they know they're doing this. They've known it since the 70s. The public doesn't know that they've known it since the 70s and that they're doing this to make money. So we need to emphasize the characters in this story. And, you know, uh, Effective social movements generally seize and hold the moral high ground. So uh, in this issue, it's the ultimate morality play. Are we going to end the future for human civilization? That's not an exaggeration. As you know, that's what we face if we don't act. But we don't talk about it that way nearly enough. So the, we also have to use language that people understand instantly. And, and you know, the linguists will tell you, and the cognitive scientists, that as you're exposed to language as a child and as you grow up, it forms literal circuitry in your brain. They call these frames. That's where the term framing comes from. So we have to use language that ignites and activates those circuits. If we use language that does not, that people don't know, they don't understand us. So when we say things like net zero, not activating, nobody knows what we're talking about. If we say we have to end the pollution that's heating the earth, pollution, brain lights up. I know what that is. And guess what else? I don't like it. Nobody likes pollution. So the language issue is essential. And it gets to a, a, a really a kind of sensitive and important issue that Movement people are making a mistake sometimes in using internal movement language as their public communication. Like, we should all be intersectional environmentalists. But if you say that in public, no one's going to know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so we have to be conscious of this. So symbolism is also very important. So the reason we succeeded in that campaign to get the pesticide out of apples is an apple a day keeps the doctor away, or at least it's supposed to. So when we said, no, it's poison, we were 
hijacking a symbol and people instantly understood. So these are some of the rules. I, I think also, I mean, tell the truth is one of the rules. Can we tell that to Rupert Murdoch? Um, and we can, you know, progressives tend to dislike simplifying things. And should I explain a little bit about why that is? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to know. All right. <laughs> okay. So we mostly come from the humanities, the law, and the sciences, where we're taught to value complexity and differentiation. Simplicity does not get you ahead. And God forbid you should repeat yourself, like, you know, someone already published a paper on that. So there's an inherent mindset in our community that the great linguist George Lakoff calls the enlightenment fallacy. That because an idea is so intrinsically brilliant, it will magically convince people and reproduce itself. It's not true. Now, the people who go to business school, they study marketing and cognitive science, and to advance their careers often, they have to sell products and services, so they learn how the brain actually works. And that's the polluting fuel companies who are manipulating public opinion because they know it's important to them. And unfortunately, while there's a propaganda war going on on this, we're not sufficiently on the field. They're dominant, and they don't need to be. So those are some of the lessons. Oh, I know one thing that I, I'm a little, you talk about the importance of TV ads and how TV ads don't cost as much as, as we think they do. As an organizer, I've always felt that the mo more important thing than TV ads was knocking on doors, was canvassing, and actually talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. Well, so, but you, you say that the most important thing is TV ads. No, I, I, in your case, <laughs> I would say, I meant as a communication rule, if you want to reach people through the media and have repetitive exposure, you, you, in this fragmented environment, if you don't buy the exposure, you won't achieve enough repetition, but knocking on doors and actual organizing is the essential complement to this because you have to reach people in their neighborhoods and their homes, and as you raise awareness through various media activities, then you need to give people something to do. So I, it's not a contradiction in my opinion. So that it has to be both then. It does. You know, I'm not an organizer, I'm a communicator. But I have the most enormous respect for people that are doing the organizing work. We won't win without it. And you, on the TV ads, won't win necessarily without the knocking on doors. I think you need both. That's need exactly both. right. But they are really much less expensive than, than people think. You know, uh, I ask people, how much do you think it costs to buy a 30-second television ad on CNN or Fox just in Washington, D.C.? And most people say $100,000. And the answer is $3,000. So then I say, well, I guess the reason we don't do that to influence the debate and the agenda in Washington, which filters to the rest of the country and the world, isn't that we can't afford it, it's just we don't think that way, but the oil companies do, so they dominate the airwaves. Well, I'm glad that you say here, recruit celebrities, influencers, and <laughs> cultural figures. <laughs> you know, a lot of people don't like that. You know, and I get attacked a lot. Well, you know, wh why are you, just because you're an actor, how come you're up here, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, who cares? You know, the, the, the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, I wouldn't care too much because it goes with the territory, as you know. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the worried, worried or they are. Is that a word? Yes. The worried or they are, it means that we're doing, that we're being affected. That's right. Yeah. But also, again... You know what, I've, I view us, the celebrities that get recruited, as repeaters. You know those, the, the towers on the top of mountains that you see? You know, when you're driving someplace, you see all those big antennas up there? They're called repeaters because what they do is they pick up weak signals in the bottom of the valleys that, that aren't strong enough to come up and over the hill to a wider audience. That's what we do. We're the repeaters at the top of the hill. Yeah, I so agree. And it's, again, it's about repetition. So with people with large followings and access to the public mind 
it, when they get involved, you reach more people more frequently. And, and you can also segment it. Like, wasn't it great that Dolly Parton came out with that climate that? song? She just wrote a climate anthem about how the world is on fire. I didn't even ask her, she just did it. <laughs> and it's really good. You know, I was, I didn't tell you this, I don't think I did anyway, but I was, a while back I was interviewed by James Carville, and the first thing he said to me was, your movement needs an anthem. No successful movement doesn't have an anthem. True. We got one. We shall overcome. <laughs> For example. So, so Dolly is reaching a whole new audience, and you know, I want to get more country music stars and NASCAR drivers and sports figures involved in this, and, and because the, we, we, I'm, I have a lot of faith in the public. If they get good information that's digestible, I think they'll do the right thing. I really don't think people are just gonna lie down and say, kill my family, destroy my property, ruin my prosperity, make my health terrible, ruin the future. Do you think that's what people would choose if they actually knew? No way. <laughs> the future. I know that you adored, I, I'm going to switch for, for a minute from the climate to who was really interesting. Given ev all the people that you've interviewed, who was, who was the most profound interview person that you know, that you've worked with? Nelson Mandela. Oh yeah, you don't even hesitate. No. Yeah. He was more than profound. I, uh, he I guess had, he knew about commun communication. He was a master at it. And, uh, and he was a master at bringing people together from different points of view and communicating a higher moral plane that made everybody resonate with him. Because he really was a, a saint. It, he, more than anyone I've ever met, transcended anger. After 27 years locked up by these people, right? No, none. And I saw that once. He took me to um, a gathering uh, with his former jailers and his architect, he wanted to build a house in Johannesburg that was an exact replica of the home he lived in on the grounds of Polesmore Prison, the last prison he was at. So I go there and he and his jailers, they're pouring over this blueprints and this model of this house and they're telling jokes and they're slapping each other's back and they're hugging each other and I'm like, what? So yeah, he was on another plane. I met, I went to Robben Island with the man that ha was in the cell next to him and, and there's a little souvenir shop on the pier that you leave from to go to Robben Island. That was one of his guards. Wow, amazing. Yeah. I, you know, and, and someone, someone I've met in our country who has some of that transcendence that Mandela did is Brian Stevenson. Do you know, you know who yeah. that is, right? Yeah, Brian Stevenson is the American lawyer who was, uh, featured in the film Just Mercy, and who uh, spends his time getting innocent people out of prison and off death row, and he works in Alabama. He built the museum to lynching, and uh, I helped him with some of his cases, getting people off death row. We, we'd make a ruckus in the media, and it would help push the Alabama, Mississippi prison system, I and mean court systems to act on these innocent people who were just rotting away. Yeah, Brian has some of that, definitely. It's I'm a, rare. I'm, I'm going to go back to climate because one of the Please. things that I made a note of here, this, this I thought was a really good thing to know. I'm going to memorize this. So under the pollution blanket we've put around the earth, there are 450,000 atomic bombs going off daily. Daily. This is what we're dealing with. Every day, 450,000 atomic bombs equivalent go off. Earth, fueling stronger storm, more severe droughts, melting polar and glacial ice, increasing rainstorms and flooding. Pretty simple, right? Actually, it's now 600,000 atom bombs a day as even more energy is being trapped on Earth now than when you did the... T so the, the, the 450,000 was when you did a TED Talk in 2012. James Hansen, I helped write his... 600,000 atom yeah. bombs every day? day? Yeah. 
so the people have, you, you know, th there's a lot of heat energy being trapped on Earth that used to go back out to space. This is the simple visualization. I wish we could get into everybody's heads. There's this blanket of pollution. The heat stays. It used to go back out to space. So I was writing this TED talk with Dr. James Hansen, and he said, I need to say that it's a lot of energy. I said, how much? He said, it's really a lot. It's a quarter watt per square meter. <laughs> I said, Jim, that doesn't sound like very much. He got really mad at me. He said, what do you mean? There's a lot of square meters on the earth. And I'm like, well, could we find another way to put that? And a, a friend of ours was with us, took out a calculator, 450,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs every day. That's how much energy is. It's actually, I hate to tell you, it's now up to almost a million because it goes up every year. So yeah, that's what we're doing. So if you wonder why there's more wildfires and storms and floods and droughts, that's why. Why do you think that the movement isn't taking communications and messaging as seriously as they did back in the 60s? I think it goes back to what I was saying before. We tend to have this idea, first of all, that we reach more people than we do and that the ideas are intrinsically so compelling by themselves that they just work. And, and, and I think there was a time that that was more true. Like I said, you got on two of the television networks and everybody saw you. That's just not true anymore. So the amount of effort and resources it takes to be sure you're reaching people repetitively is more complex. And it, it's not inside our movement yet, but our enemies, this is what they do, so I'm hoping we'll come to terms with this uh, because if we, if we don't wake the population up to the urgency of this and then help them mobilize, we won't defeat this most powerful industry that ever existed. That's what it's going to take. So t tell the story about, uh, because you were, you were at the Chica trial of the Chicago 8, um, and, and uh, I, I have a dog in that in that battle. Mean an so does Barbara Williams. Where are you, Barbara? Here. You're hey, here. Barbara. We were both married to Tom. Hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> at different times. But, um, <laughs> um, t t t t tell, on that same subject of messaging and communications, sure. talk about your experience there. So, I'm a punk kid, right? I'm 17 years old. I, I get assigned to cover the Chicago 7 trial by Liberation News Service. I'd never been in a courtroom. I go into this courtroom the day they bind and gag Black Panther leader Bobby Seale and put a, a gag in his mouth and tie him to a chair. And I'm like, is this what happens in court? It was. So we would, I, you know, at, coming from a radical news service, I was, you know, basically with the, the, the defendants, Abby and Tom and Jay Rubin and John Froyens and. Lee Weiner and Dave Dellinger and, and, and Rennie Davis. And um, so they had a defense office um, and we would go back to the office every afternoon after the trial. And the main event is we would watch the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite for our reviews <laughs> to see how well we had done at the trial that day because the, the trial was approached by the defendants as theater and as an educational effort on the war. And it was, you know, if you've seen the movie, I urge you to read the transcript. I mean, it was, it was an incredibly brilliant thing. But that was what our orientation was. How is the mass public perceiving these events? And everything was calibrated for that. So I feel that that's a consciousness that we need again. Yeah, yeah. Um. Why do you think this book is relevant today? <laughs> I hope it is. Um, well, because uh, you know there are basic principles of this, and why should everybody have to learn them all over again? The, yeah. the activists have to win hearts and minds. There are ways to do it that work, and and there's styles and language that work, and there's styles and language that re that that repel too much of the public. And are you know like being in a bubble, so we have to come out of the bubble 
and I'm hoping that, that this helps. Plus, I wanted to show some great photos and tell some fun stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and there's a picture of you getting arrested in this book. Don't think I didn't know this. <laughs> see, I, whenever I get a book, the first thing I do is to go and see if I'm in it. <laughs> you know, everybody does that. Not really. <laughs> right. I think, um, I, I think that while we're here and we have this wonderful audience, we should talk about what we think needs to happen. Um, I think we, we both agree that it's so hard to talk and hold a microphone. That there, there needs to be a two prong. Is it called a pincher strategy? We have to get people in unprecedented numbers in the streets, disrupting life in this country, to force our leaders to do what's right. Huge numbers of people have to be in the streets. Um, but if everybody on the other side of the wall, whether it's in Los Angeles, at, at, at the Capitol, in Sacramento, or in Washington, D.C., the people on the inside have to be responsive to all that pressure out there. The reason the New Deal could be so successful is because the pressure was coming. Well, tell the story about it. Tell that little story, and then I'll continue. Sure. You know what I'm talking sure, about. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. So uh, when Franklin Roosevelt won the presidency the first time, all the progressive and union leaders went to see him and laid out their agenda. They wanted this and that, and you know, unemployment insurance and social security and you know, all these things. And Roosevelt turned to them and said, I agree with you on everything. Now go out and make me do it. That's a true story. Yeah. And uh, so that's what we have to do. And Jerry Brown used to do that too. He used to say to me and Tom, come on, make me do it. I've got to be forced. We have to force them. So you need a lot of people on the outside, but then, we got to do something about the people on the inside. If you can't change the people, change the people. Yeah. And that's why last year I started the Jane Fonda Climate Pack, which, with your help, we're going to make this big. Right now we're mostly down ballot because we're small. But too many Democrats, as well as Republicans, are taking money from the fossil fuel industry. And as long as that's true, they're not going to pass the policies that we have to pass, that the scientists unanimously are saying we have to pass. So we have to vote them out. We have to get people to run who are real climate champions. That means they don't take money from the fossil fuel industry. That means they've done something public to show they've got guts, stand up to the fossil fuel industry. We need to electoralize people's climate concerns. People are wandering around the way I have sometimes, really scared, really sad, really despondent about what is looming and don't know what to do about it. Voting is really important and before you vote, find out where the person you're thinking of voting gets their money. You can do that. You can find out where their money comes from. Don't vote for people. Go to the polls with the climate in your heart. So then you've got, we're coming at them from both ways. You know, this bill that just passed that extended the debt ceiling, and we're glad that we didn't go into default and all that kind of thing, but boy, did they attach a lot of really bad things to that bill in terms of climate and fossil fuels. And we all looked at each other and said, you know what, the problem is none of those Democrats worried for one nanosecond about what their vote in favor of that bill was gonna do to their electorability. They should be scared. If I vote for a bill that is going to make the climate crisis worse, I better worry that I'm not going to be reelected. Now they don't feel any fear at all. We've got to make them afraid. And this is particularly true this year and next year in California because we have a huge fight on our hands. Do you know that? Do you mind if I run this down? Okay. Because you live in California too. What if I didn't? It's still important. <laughs> Well, this is your evening, so I would shut up. <laughs> but but you, you, you want, do you want to talk about the referendum? Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, Jane is so right. It, the political system is corrupted by the money from the oil, coal, and gas industry. It's just pure corruption. So Jane starting this pack to counter the influence of that money needs everybody's support. Remember, Obama 
raised hundreds of millions of dollars to run for president in small donations of 15 to $25. And if we could do that to match and even neutralize the fossil fuel money in Congress and other governments, it would be a game changer, that and a more aroused and mobilized public. Those are the two ingredients. Fight them on the money battle and fight them in the streets. And if you do both, then we have a chance of winning this. In California, uh, through Jane and other activist efforts, finally, uh, the, the governor agreed to these setbacks that you, you know, can't drill for oil and gas within, what is it, 3,000 feet of a home or a school, feet. right. Imagine, they, you know, they, they used to be okay, uh, you know, drill across the street from your house or a school. So we finally got this, and now the, 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 the polluting industries have put an initiative on the ballot to reverse it, because they want to drill in front of people's homes and schools, they're so nice. So, so this is an epic battle. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of organizing and a lot of money to defeat them. So that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. They spent $10 million to get the signatures on the ballot so they could get this to be voted on November 2024. They told people, we have to defeat this bill because if, that, if this setback thing happens, people are going to get really sick. It's going to make people in the community sick. The exact opposite. It said the gas prices would go up. All lies, and they have ads now, maybe some of you have seen. These incredibly persuasive, beautifully done ads. We have to get ads up to refute every point they make. It's all lies. And they're spending $100 million or $150 million, and we have to match them. Can you imagine if a setback bill in California is defeated by the oil companies, the precedent that that will set. I mean, this is really all hands on deck. We cannot allow this to happen. So I just want you to know this is looming in the future for California, but we have to begin now to think about it. And we have to, I mean, I don't know who you are. I, I, don't, I know one person in here. <laughs> and I just met your son, and I don't know how to get in touch with you, but eventually we're going to be putting out the call, please come. You know, it could be to go and lobby in Sacramento, it could be to make a, you know, a ruckus in the streets, whatever that will lead to, but nonviolent always, we cannot... The reason, one very important reason that we have to be totally committed to nonviolence is that's the way to find out if you have agents in your midst. Anybody in your group who's trying to get you to do something violent, you can bet your bottom dollar they're an agent. And that's how you find out. You have to have a tough law, no violence here. Yeah? Absolutely. And you know, I, people should feel agency, a lot has been accomplished in California. There's, you know, we've won a lot here and, and we can win this. There's no question about it, but we have to take it on. It's a, it's, you know, for the oil companies, it's, and they're really pissed, you know, because it's going to be very hard to win. It, it, it won't be easy, but it is. I think it's winnable. When you know, you know, I've gone to people's homes that are in front of oil and fracking wells, and you probably have too. It's just unbelievable what these people put up with. Anybody that sees it, you know, their heart's going to go out to these people. So I think we could defeat it. I really do. Good. <laughs> Can we and, take? And how do people find Jane Pack to contribute to it? JanePack.com. Simple. Are you, gonna the truth. Re are you gonna repeat that? Janepack.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Please yeah. go. All right, Andrea, should we take questions from the audience? Okay, great. What'd she say? She's coming. I've got new hearing aids and they don't work. Oh boo. <laughs> so um, who has a question? Right we here. Work. We don't need to take the time to hand people I the Okay, well, yeah, huh? because... It, it, oh, for the broadcast? This is being broadcast? Oh, yeah. I wish I'd known before. <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't say anything bad. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for everything you've done. I've just worshipped you for 50 years. And you saved my husband's life. I can tell you about that later. Um, my name's Sarah Nichols, and 
The fact is, bribery is a felony everywhere but in government. Why do we call them lobbyists? Why don't we call lobbying bribery? It's just bribery, pure and simple. Good idea. I like that. Talk about wordsmithing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We We've hired all these bribers. Is that what you would Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. We have to rename the registration law, the bribery registration law. Good thinking. Who else? Hello. Can you hear me um, through my mask? I have a lot to ask and a lot to say, but I'm going to limit it to a political call to action for the state of Virginia, the legislature there. We want to turn it from red to blue. They're having an election a week from today, and you can donate to some really progressive candidates while there's still time. And I... I I personally go to blueamericapack.com. Or, or Would you take your max, mask off for a second while you say that so people okay. can understand? Okay. I think I'm going to give you downwithtyranny.com. It's a website that you can find some recommendations for candidates who are running for election. It might take a little searching, but... I have the, a whole slate. My, my PAC is endorsing a whole slate of candidates in, in running in the Virginia legislature. Okay, all right, go so to go to janepack.com and you'll see who to support. There that. you go. Okay, that's all. Just, you know, help Virginia. <laughs> Hi, Jane. My name's Catherine. I was a member of CED. I was also an advanced person during Tom's campaign. And I remember the meetings going to CED. I mean, I was floored. It was amazing meetings. And no, when, trouble you. Oh, can you hear me? You, yeah. I, yeah. I, I said I was a member of Jane and Tom's organization, uh -huh. CED, Campaign for Campaign Economic, for Economic, Economic, Economic Democracy. Democracy. It's the organization that the Jane Fonda Workout funded. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so my question is, what would be today's version of CED to get the word out because even at, during the campaign we were always phone banking phone banking and just uh, you know so my well there's two big differences that is a really good question two big differences between those days and now first of all we had an organization we had chapters from San Diego all the way up to the northern part of California so there was a stable organization number one with very strategic leadership the second thing is unions were very robust then. So you could have support from these very, very powerful unions, especially the farm workers union. See, Cesar Chavez was very supportive of Tom's efforts. Those thing, both those things, generally unions and then the farm workers union specifically because of how progressive they were, those don't exist anymore, so it's much harder and then on top of that, it's what you said, is that we're not keyed in enough to how to, how to communicate what we're doing. Or, or to do enough mobilization. I mean, I mean, I ask people, if you were going to take action on climate change after this meeting tonight online, do you know where you would go? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you see? So, Gangpack.com. That's so one way. For, for aggregating political donations, that's fantastic and long overdue. Thank you, Jane. But there's other actions people need to take, and we don't really have a strong mobilization platform on this issue. You know, Move On at its peak was a great mobilization platform. We don't have a Move On for climate change. So these are, you know, there are gaps in what the movement needs to do. There's so much great organizing going on, but, but, but this kind of question of what are average people do, what do they know, we're less focused on this. You know, the, the professional NGOs do a lot of great things. They, they work on policy. They work on lawsuits against the government, thank goodness. They work on science. But in the early days, those groups mobilized the public. They did Earth Day. They won all these incredible pieces of legislation by putting people in the streets. They don't do that so much anymore. There are exceptions, of course. So I think this is coming again. These things come in waves, as you know. Like right here in Hollywood, there are new efforts on climate change, 
at, that are most welcome. You know, like Adam McKay, the director, has started a studios to make climate content. I think Stacy from his team is here. It's right? called Yellow Dot. Yeah, yellowdotstudios.com, yellowdotstudios.com. And I know of a group of musicians that are planning to form a whole new effort on this. There's talk of some health professionals doing this. I, I think these kinds of things come in waves. And, I'm, you know, when people see the fires and the smoke and the storms and, you know, it, it's getting hard to ignore this stuff. Uh, I'm sure that uh, much bigger waves of activism are coming and thank you for helping to stoke it. Well, on Thursday, um, I am l uh, with a lot of other activists on Zoom launching a summer of protest. So if you, if you, let's see, how will I let you know what time and how to join? <laughs> What? Website. 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 Okay. Would it be as a blog or a? No. What? A notice. A notice. A, notice. a headline. Posted. Okay. <laughs> like Instagram? Yes. Oh. An Instagram. Okay. I will. Put, I will go home tonight and I will put a notice on Instagram. Um. Does, would everybody be able to f access it? I, I don't, I'm... Yeah, there, if, if I use social media, but I d really don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you're not on Instagram, ask your child. They'll help yeah. you. <laughs> so Instagram, and I'll put on how to, how to join up, and you'll see what's going to happen this... A what? A tech person. IT. IT. Yeah, she's my daughter-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> she's very smart, though, but she doesn't let me know how to do it. I wonder why. Listen, I didn't even start to use a computer till I was about 70. <laughs> okay, other questions? Yeah, hi, I'm Sai, former SDS card-carrying member. Okay. Student for Democratic Society, yes. Yes. Um, so in this era of disinformation and lies, how do you begin a dialogue with someone who's just so convinced you're wrong and they're right? I would say, you know, from the heart, but, you know, if they're so convinced, what do you do? Uh, you know, in, uh, it used to be that in wars you could parachute people behind enemy lines and blow up the enemy's transmitter. Now there's an idea. <laughs> right after I've talked now about Now we can't do that now, but we sure have an enemy, uh, you know, I mean, the intentional disinformation from Rupert Murdoch's empire is, you know, beyond anything that's happened in this country in, in, in a very long time. So they, you're right, they, they have engaged in intentional brainwashing. And it is very hard to convince people that are locked in an alternative reality from television, which affects the subconscious. It's not like the pamphlets in Tom Paine's time. It just goes deep into your head. So it is difficult, but it can be done. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm of the belief that we won't solve climate change if we don't get some conservatives on board. Because this really threatens them and they don't know. So if you're a conservative in this country and you go online, all you're going to learn about climate change is it's a hoax. That's all you will see. And then you turn on Fox News and this other stuff and it reinforces it again. So how do we expect them to think anything else? So I did an experiment. I made videos where conservatives who are with us on climate change talked to conservatives about how climate change threatens conservative values like freedom and security and prosperity and health. And we bought these into the social media feeds of Republicans and hired a Republican polling firm and measured the results and they worked. We changed the information flow to people and guess what? Their thinking started to change. So it can be done. And when I talk to conservatives, I start with this. I say, look, I'd like to understand something. Why is it so difficult for you to accept that 
carbon dioxide traps heat on Earth. And if we have too much of it in the atmosphere, it's going to get too hot. What is the problem that you can't accept this? We've known it for centuries. And that tends to start a discussion. And then you can get someplace because it really comes down to that. So, so I'm not trying to be naive about this. I think we have to create uh, some unity with some parts of the other side. There are good people there. They're being, you know, they're fed distorted information. I believe we could change that. When, when you say that you were trying to talk to somebody, was it about climate? Yeah. It was, okay. I, um, there's a woman, she's a climate scientist named Catherine Hayhoe. She's a Christian evangelical. And boy, can she talk to people. Right? H-A-Y-H-O-E, Catherine with the K. What's the name of the, her book? Uh, Saving Us. Yeah. A great book. Get, yeah, H-A-Y-O-E, get the book, Saving Us, and it'll give you all kinds of ideas True. about how to talk. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I had a question that kind of builds on this last discussion, and that is, could you speak a little bit on the balance between fear and hope mm. in messaging? because obviously Obama went on hope, and we've got an atmosphere of increasing fear. We're talking about fear of the future and losing our future, but you have the option of maybe framing something around the opportunity for economic development and prosperity through clean energy and other types of things. So how do you mix those two? Sure, that's a really good question. So it is a question of how to mix them exactly. It's not a binary choice. You know, some people will say, well, you know, don't scare people. And others will, you know, just give them hope. But you can't just do either or. So what we've learned is that you have to emphasize hope. Because if you just tell people the world's going to end, then their nervous system shuts down. It's too hard to contemplate. And, you know, there are psychologists who say that when you, we think about uh, the destruction of the earth from climate change, it goes through similar patterns and pathways in the brain to thinking about death and dying. And people don't tend to like to think about that. So it is very important in order to get people to accept the enormity of this crisis that we are in, to show them that there's a way out. So the, the formula roughly that tends to work is about two thirds hope and one third fear. If, if you don't have hope, people shut down. But if you don't create some fear, legitimate, accurate, scientific fear, then there's no urgency. And this is frigging urgent. You know, most people don't know this, but the, the World Climate Science Body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we talked about this tonight, what they said is that we have seven years to cut global pollution in half to have a 50% chance of maintaining a livable climate by staying under uh, about three degrees Fahrenheit. A 50% chance. We have to cut it in half in seven years. That's urgent. So we have to let people know that that's the situation we face and that we don't have to. We have 90% of the technologies to solve this. They're almost all cheaper than the dirty energy technologies. People don't know that either. They, if you poll people, they think clean energy is more expensive. It's the least expensive. But we don't tell the people these things, so they don't know. You feel answered? Yes. We have one over here. Sorry, we have one over here. <laughs> Uh, hi, thanks so much for doing this tonight. And I think uh, one of the things that I was really interested hearing you say early on was the power of music. And so you've talked a lot about TV and, and video, but you know, hearing now for me music that was from before I was alive, it was always noticeable to me that there was much more protest in that. And so I'm curious, you know, as, as activists, did you communicate with the bands and say, hey, you should write about these things and sing about them? Were they naturally more inclined to sing about this? And, and maybe why these days do you think that musicians aren't taking up the same you know, um, industry-wide communication of this? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
Well, it was a combination of the war in Vietnam and the draft. So we were all of the same generation and we were all threatened with being killed. You know, 50,000 Americans were killed fighting in Vietnam and what, hundreds of thousands were injured. And so there was an imminence and, and this affected the musicians and it affected everybody. So the, the theme songs of the anti-Vietnam pro protest movement came out of that. And the other reason is uh, we were all taking the same drugs. <laughs> I don't know about you, but... <laughs> this is being broadcast, you said. <laughs> uh, most of them are legal today. It's very important that all kinds of artists, musicians, writers, painters, sculptors, become involved. You know, art has a way of bypassing our sensors and the things that, art shows that the way things are doesn't, isn't the way it has to be, that it can be different. It takes us unaware and kind of pierces our consciousness when we're not prepared. Very often, especially when you're laughing, I don't know if any of you have, have, have come to great aha moments while you were building a stone wall or laughing, and just ideas come to you in new kinds of ways. So try to encourage the artists that you know to, to do things about the climate crisis. I mean, Dolly Parton just wrote a climate song. I think this stuff is coming back, I really do. Yeah. And, and you know, Adam McKay, the director, he has this term I love. He, he says what we need is more laughtivism. <laughs> He's so funny. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think this book is so important to have right now. Um, I'm what, I, I kind of have two things. One, I'm curious what your plan is about getting this book in the hands of young people. Um, I'm an elder millennial, but what's happening with Gen Z and how they uh, rally together for all sorts of things is kind of incredible. Jane, and I think you both should be on TikTok. I know a lot of people scoff at TikTok because it's a place where we dance, but what has happened in the community of TikTok? I mean, 800 people gathered in Washington Square Park to sing a song about a fish, right? Like. There, there's um, incredible climate news that's happening. People are getting news about the train derailment that happened that wasn't being aired anywhere else on, on uh, public broadcasting. It's such an incredible tool, and if you put something on TikTok, it always ends up on Instagram, and it always ends up on Facebook, and that is like really where a lot of the young people are gathering and speaking and sharing ideas. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was an entire musical that people put on right. through TikTok. Like, it's such an incredible medium. And if you're wondering where the young people are, I think it's there. And I really hope you consider going on there and, and uh, sharing this book, because I think that that's really where our hope is. Yeah. I so agree. And uh, Yellow Dot's making material for TikTok. Right, Stacey? We, okay, there we go. I think we can... <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. One, how about two more questions? I hear wailing going on back here. Okay, is two more questions? Three more questions. Or three. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. This lady over here. Hello, um, I'm wondering if you've heard of deep canvassing and what you think of it as a, as a campaign strategy for issues. How's it different from regular canvassing? Well, it, it's um, going door to door and having deep conversations with people standing on the doorstep until one has the feeling as the canvasser that the person feels respected and feels that they're Same. being... Yeah, exactly. Seen. People exactly. want to be seen and heard. Yeah. Yes, I'm on the board of Working America, which has the largest grassroots canvassing organization in the country. And um, I guess that's what you would call deep canvassing. Um, they change lives on people's front porches. And, but what, what is important about canvassing? Because the, you know, if, if there's a can candidate that you all like and you're gonna work for them, going door to door is one of the most effective things you can do. It really means something to somebody. Oh my God, this person is out there, you know, and actually showed up on my doorstep to talk about this. It matters to people. 
But what's really important is that the good canvassing organizations like Working America, they do it year around. They become the trusted messenger. And, and that's why canvassing is so, the deep canvassing is, is so important. Yeah. Thank you. We've got one more over here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I'm <clears throat> Richard Green. I just want to acknowledge that we are in the presence of progressive royalty with you, David, with you, Jane, and with the person who's not here, which is your and Barbara's uh, ex-husband, Tom, that you are representing. And I just want to give you guys another big hand for what you've done. Equally, I teach civics, and we were talking about TikTok and reaching young people and you were complaining about what happened with the, the budget deal and, the, and, and what we had to give up for that. And I don't know if you knew that we had to give all those things up because of 9,170 votes that caused us to lose five seats in the United States House, which allowed Kevin McCarthy, instead of Hakeem Jeffries, to be the Speaker of the House. And I think, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> you talk a lot about making sure that we elect people who do not take money from fossil fuel companies. And I think that's awesome. But the truth is, almost every single Democrat, even conservative Democrats, vote pretty much the right way on climate and on choice and on all sorts of, they, they do. No, they they un don't. I'm sorry. Jane, they we're don't. happy to provide that information to you. They don't vote well. Manchin's a Democrat. I'm sorry? Joe Manchin's a Democrat. Right. He's the largest recipient of fossil fuel money right. in the Congress. But, but, but we're so lucky to have Joe Manchin because, oh. no, seriously, again, I teach civics. I'll have that conversation with you. We would not have the judges. Oh, hold on. I, I want to ask. Let, let him finish. I want to ask questions. Let, let's let him finish. We wouldn't have all the judges that got confirmed if it wasn't for Joe Manchin. We wouldn't have a majority. He's in a state that, that voted for Trump by 40 points. The question is, shouldn't we be getting everyone in this room who almost for sure has young people in their family that do not vote to get out and vote for Democrats and then drill deeper if we can to have the best Democrats beyond that? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yes, more people should vote, absolutely, but you ha there's a cynicism that keeps people from voting, so it's complicated, as you know, if, you know, when they see these horrible compromises made in, you know, real politic, and it's just deflating. You know, on TikTok, as you may know, there was this amazing organizing to try to stop President Biden from approving the horrible Willow oil project in the, in the Arctic, and it was very vibrant and you know, became a big pressure on the White House. It wasn't enough to win, but next time it might be. Do we have another question? Yeah, last question. Coming right up, last question. Um, as activists, I'm sure you've probably been discouraged before from what you've seen and what you've you know, been fighting for. So my question is, how, do you have any advice for activists on kind of how to work through that and continue to... To work through what, getting depressed and despaired? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, periods of despair and depression. How do you work through it? Yeah, this is how we want, we want to end on an upbeat note, guys. <laughs> no, it's Carrie. a good question. <laughs> the way to overcome despair and hopelessness is to, to take action. You know, Greta, Greta Thunberg, she said, don't go looking for hope. Look for action and hope will come. I personally in my own life know that's true. I was really, really depressed in 2019, and then I started Fire Drill Friday. When you know you're doing all you can, you're hopeful. Not optimistic. Optimistic, optimism and hope is very different. Optimism is everything's gonna be fine, but you don't do anything to make it so. Hope is a muscle, like the heart. You, you have to be active to have hope. Bravo. know that. You know, our, our, 
Our friend Amory Lovins, he calls it applied hope. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, David. And um, David will sign his fabulous book in the lobby, and we'll see you soon. I only have one more program for the rest of this season. That's on Thursday night, and then we'll see you next season. Who is it on Thursday night? It's Sell it. Jane Smiley, Thursday night at the Wallace. Okay. So, yeah. It's been Thank a you, everybody. great season. Thank you.